Barb has worked in a general hematology clinic at Cancer Care Manitoba from 2002 until July of this year. Since then, she has moved to the role of nurse educator. Barb has been a nurse for 36 years, and 22 of those years have been in an oncology or hematology setting. She completed her MSN from the University of Phoenix in 2007 and learned that old dogs really can learn new tricks. Barb remains passionate about hematology and the front lines of oncology nursing. She has served on a national board for the Canadian Association of Nurses and Oncology. Blood. They're blood bound, dependent. And I'm going to do this with a little bit of a story by a character named Lily who's fictional. Many, in fact, all of the circumstances in Lily's story have really happened to somebody that I've known at Cancer Care. All of the, the demographics and identity things have been denatured, so you won't be able to figure out who it is. But the things that happen to Lily happen to many people in that population of patients. So I want you to use your imaginations as you, uh, as you go through this. I do want to give you a bit of a definition about transfusion dependency, and the literature is not really clear on this. But for pur purposes of this presentation and for the way we use transfusion dependency in the hematology and cancer care world, it's people who stuck with getting red cells for the rest of their life. Some people are born that way, some people acquire a condition, but it's not something that's going to go away. It's an ongoing need, which makes them bound to blood. So Lily's story really began about three generations ago. And I'm kind of nervous about talking to you about my story because I don't really have much education. And I have heard from Barb that you guys are all really smart. And you all have like initials after your name and stuff. But I thought that my story might still be a good story for you because although there's lots of us in the treatment room at Cancer Care, there's not a lot of people who have to live their whole life dependent on whether or not and when they can get red blood cells. So my story started back a few generations in Italy. My great grandparents and my grandparents knew lots of people who had babies who died Small, small children who died, but nobody really knew what it was. My parents got married and they came about 36 years ago to Manitoba. My dad was a, an Italian chef and he heard that those Canadians love Italian food and he thought, well, if he came to Manitoba, he'd be able to make a really good living making Italian food. So about 10 hours northwest of Winnipeg, at a truck stop, he set up a restaurant, and he was really busy. He didn't have to make a whole lot of Italian food in December and January, but the rest of the year, he was pretty busy. I was born this way, and when I first heard Lady Gaga's song a couple of years ago, I got kind of mad because it says God doesn't make any mistakes. I thought God did make a mistake. I'm 34 years old right now. I'm four foot 11 and I weigh 82 pounds. When I was a toddler and a baby, my mom used to say, what is wrong with you? Your brother was not like this. That's true. My brother wasn't like this. My brother Carlos is 18 months older than me and apparently he didn't give my parents any trouble at all. However, I was irritable and cranky, and didn't like to eat. My stomach looked really bloated but my legs were really skinny. One day my mother just couldn't take it anymore and she went to the nursing station near where she lives. And there the doctor said, oh, your baby's hemoglobin is really low. She doesn't have enough blood to give her any iron. He says, well, maybe I won't get you to just give her iron. We're gonna give her a transfusion and then I'm gonna have you go to Winnipeg. I got a transfusion and went to Winnipeg. And then it was only like two weeks and apparently I got another one. I don't remember much about this because I was somewhere around nine to 10 months when I first started getting blood transfusions. But I hear the stories around the table and Carlos always is like, oh, you and your blood, you and your blood. That's all we ever pay attention to at our house, you and your blood. But my parents were told, you get these transfusions, you see the doctor in Winnipeg, or Lily will probably die. And then my mom started thinking about her great-grandparents in Italy, her grandparents in Italy, and some of the kids she knew when she was in like junior high 
who died like at 12 or 13. But it didn't really affect her much, she says, because they hardly ever came to school and she didn't get to see them. So in one year as a toddler, some people were learning their ABC, some people were watching Mickey Mouse. This is what I had to do. This is what I got in one year as a toddler. It wasn't easy, but it is kind of a blessing. I found this skull online because I was looking up my disorder and I thought, ooh, ooh. Do any of you notice that this skull looks a little bit different? Do you see all that white fluffy stuff standing up above the skull? When I started reading about my disorder, I learned that if I didn't get blood transfusions, bone marrow would try to comp compensate. So my bone marrow wouldn't just grow in my bones. My bone marrow expanded till it was growing outside my bones. And all that white fluffy top stuff on the top of the skull is bone marrow expansion. I want you to understand this. I'm 34 years old, but some of my friends in the treatment room at Cancer Care are late 30s and 40s. They were born before people got transfusions, and this happened to them. Their bone marrow expanded. Some of them got spleens that made them look nine months pregnant, but they all had skinny little legs and arms like me. This changed the way their faces look. I'm lucky because I got blood transfusion young, and my face looks like my face, but some of them have faces that don't look like they probably were designed to look. Because of the bone marrow spreading out, the shape of their face changed. They got foreheads that were prominent, jaws that were prominent. They feel like they look a little bit funny. I know several of these people, and I'm kind of glad I'm not 40 years old, that I'm only 34. So we went to Winnipeg, and we saw the blood doctor. And the blood doctor told my mom and dad what the problem was. I had something called beta thalassemia major. Now, lots of my friends that get transfusion at cancer care have other disorders that they were born with. So what I have isn't what's really important for this talk, but how it's made my life is pretty important for this talk. I have beta thalassemia major. I was born that way. I always felt like God maybe did ma make a mistake, but this is what I had to live with. But can you imagine my parents? They have one normal son, and then they have me. I had to come to Winnipeg for transfusions. There was the nursing station that was the closest place to where my dad's restaurant was couldn't give blood transfusions and still can't. It was a 10-hour drive to Winnipeg. Two units of blood every month. So when school started, that's Carlos and I going off to school. I was really happy to go to school. I thought I might be like a normal kid now that I was in school. And then I disappeared for four days. And all my friends wondered, what's wrong with Lily? She's never at school. And they started getting other friendships. She's gone so much or too tired to do things with them gone so much that they really didn't notice that I was whether I was there or not. It took a, a whole day to drive to Winnipeg and my mom was supposed to help my dad in the restaurant but she couldn't because she drove us to Winnipeg to get my blood transfusions. So that meant that my dad had to do all the work himself and he worked really long hours. So that meant that my mom had to take Carlos to Winnipeg with her every month. Carlos, who was healthy, had nothing wrong with him, had to come to Winnipeg four days a month, too. So he was about nine years old, and then my, my dad thought it would be safe for him to sit in the kitchen at the restaurant. So for four evenings a month, this cost my family a lot. They came from Italy hoping for a better life. They had to pay gas for the 10 hours to Winnipeg, gas for the 10 hours back from Winnipeg, two nights in a hotel or a hostel, and my mom couldn't help my dad in the restaurant. So it did cost them a lot. When we got to Winnipeg, the first thing I do is run and get my blood tested, because then I knew by the next morning they could start the transfusions and I could get my blood. Up until I was about 18 years old, I had to get my transfusions on Monday to Friday, because cancer care didn't have treatment on the weekends. After that, I was able to get my blood transfusions on Saturday or Sunday, 
and it meant that he actually went down to missing just two week, two days of school and one weekend every month. Needles hurt a lot. And I think that we have this much ability to cope with the pain of needles in our life. And I used this much ability to cope up by the time I was about seven years old. And I'd start to feel sick every time I knew I was going to have to get another needle for a blood test, another needle for the transfusion. And it got harder and harder for the nurses. And sometimes it was five or six needle pokes to start the blood transfusion. At one point, they gave me a central line. And I'll tell you a little bit, a little later, about why they gave me a central line. Yeah, I had this thing like hanging out of my chest. And that was all right, sort of. But one day, I was playing with my cat. The cat bit right through it. And there was just no way to change this line from the outside. And doctors didn't really want me going around with an open line with cat bites and germs in it. So I had to have a little procedure. And they took out the central line and they put in a port. Now a port, I think it looks like the doctors and nurses stethoscopes are cut and they got stuck under my skin. And then they shoved the needle into the stethoscope because that's about exactly the right same size as it is. It was still a needle poke, but it was a little needle. And most of the time, the nurse got the right spot with one needle poke and it saved me blood tests and it saved me needle pokes to start transfusions. But after about 11 years, the nurses would put in the normal saline and they'd try to pull blood out. Roll over, stretch up, bend down, stand on your head, put in the normal saline, try to pull, it didn't work anymore. So they had to take that port out. Another procedure, another surgery. And they put one in on the other side. At this point, I was like about 15 years old, just starting to think about trying to show some cleavage. And I had one big scar here and one big scar here with the top of a stethoscope stuck under my skin. I have to tell you all about iron. Do you give iron to people who are anemic, who have low hemoglobins like me? And the first doctor my parents saw, they really wanted to give me iron, but they didn't know and now I know, and I hope everybody who's transfusion or blood bound or transfusion dependent knows iron is not good for us. They told me that iron is very environmental friendly because it's meant to be recycled. It's designed to be recycled. How much in the world is designed to be recycled? Iron is, didn't help me much. It's meant to be when your cells break down, when they get too old, they're supposed to, you know, the next cells, the newborn baby ones, are supposed to take the old iron and use it. So they were dumping in iron to my body. Every transfusion I got, and I wasn't recycling any. And on top of that, somehow my body got the message, you're anemic, absorb more iron. So apparently even I was absorbing more iron because I didn't have a good hemoglobin. So they're dumping it in, I'm over absorbing it, and lo and behold, when I was 14, I went into heart failure. The reason why heart failure happened to me is because so much of this iron went into the muscles of my heart that it got like fibrotic, like bamboo, and didn't push and expand and push and expand properly. So blood collected in my ankles. I was short of breath. <laughs> I just like, I would get my transfusion and I couldn't even like walk across the hall. And I thought, well, I just got blood. I shouldn't be like so, what, just so wimpy. Like I just got blood. I should be like doing something, but I can't breathe. My ferritin was 7,000 and some odd. The normal range of a ferritin is anywhere from like maybe 200 to 500. So then they thought I had a liver burden. I don't know how I feel about having a liver burden, but I didn't like it the first time they decided to see how big it was because that's when they had to do a liver biopsy. I had to get needles again, and they had to put a needle into my liver and take out tissue. But now they've got this cool thing called a liver MRI where they actually can measure my liver burden with an MRI. It's noisy for like a long time, but better than another needle, right? So then they found out, yep, I've got a huge liver burden. I've got a huge heart iron burden as well. So I'm in heart failure. 
My liver's crap. Don't ever drink, they told me. I was 15. I had to start something called chelation. Yuck. So this is when I got that central line that I was telling you about a while ago, the one that Smokey played with. I got that central line because they decided to give me a drug 24 hours a day, seven days a week through this intravenous. Made me pee orange, I swear, like orange like the sun, except what made me pee gray. All I knew was what something wasn't right and nobody was ever going to get a chance to see my pee because it was a funny color. But the nurse in the clinic told me that's not bad because that means the iron is coming out of your body. We have no way in our bodies to get rid of extra iron. But if we mix the iron with a drug that binds it to the drug, the drug knows how to carry it out. And you know why I have orange pee? Because the drug carries it out through my kidneys and bladder. Some of it gets carried out with my poop, but I didn't pay that much attention to that color. So after my ferritin got down to about 2,500, they said, this is really good news. Remember, the normal ferritin, if you like you're around 400, it's like a little high. 2,500, good news. And it meant that I didn't need the central line and the 24 hours a day, seven days a week chelation anymore. They allowed me, they gave me the privilege of going back home and putting in a needle every single night, connect it up to this pump that wasn't going kaboom, kaboom, like the MRI, but was going all night long. I swear, I almost wish I was deaf. As long as I was doing this seven days, seven nights a week, my ferritin stayed around 2,500 or 3,000, and this was apparently good news. Like I said, I was 16. And that 16 comes with its own problems. Are you aware of 16-year-old problems? Sometimes I felt just like Cinderella. I'd go out to have fun, and all the time I'd be aware of the clock going. And I'm so glad we couldn't afford a cell phone because I'm sure my mama would have set the alarm to go off at 8.30. Get home! Get your chelation! You want to have a heart attack? You're only 16! So out like Cinderella at the ball, had to run out of whatever I was doing. And then when I was like 18, I had control. Mama could say what she wanted, Papa could say what he wanted, but I was really the boss of me. And I decided, yeah. Chelation. Who cares? This is a sucky life anyways. I've got things going ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, all night long. Every six months I've got ba -bung, ba -bung, ba -bung, ba -bung. I have to drive all the way to Winnipeg, all the way back. Carlos kicks the back of the seat the whole way there. And Mama turns around and says, stop kicking the seat! And like it was just like for years. It was endless. So I thought, well, okay, maybe a heart attack and dying wouldn't be so bad. Except... It's a slow way to go. It didn't work fast enough. It didn't work fast enough for me to die that way. So I want to tell you about some of my friends in the treatment room at Cancer Care. There are others like me who have beta thalassemia major. I met some people who have something called genital sideroblastic anemia. They never made red cells much of their own either. There were people with sickle cell anemia weren't quite as blood bound. They got a lot of transfusion, but they didn't have to come in every single month. Maybe when they were just having a crisis. There were people with weird things like diamond black fat anemia. I thought like this sounds like some sort of rattlesnake. But then there were the old people. These were people who weren't born blood bound like me. These were people who were just going along, living their life, and all of a sudden their bone marrow stopped making red cells. Their bone marrow didn't try to expand, so they didn't have to worry about that, but it just quit doing what it was doing. And it, a lot of those people had something called MDS. And some of them had myelofibrosis. The people with a myelofibrosis, it was maybe their marrow. It made their spleens go huge because apparently their bone marrow was crap, so it, their spleens did try to go to compensate. Did you know when you were an embryo, your spleen made your blood cells? So you go back that way, and your spleen, if you've got myelofibrosis, your spleen tries to do it again. One of the guys with MDS, I call him my Magoo. He was a little man. He had the biggest black glasses you ever saw with Coke bottle lenses, and like he's always looking at me. 
And every time I went in to have my transfusion, he'd be sitting there, and he'd be excited to see me. Lily, you're here today. I'm so glad because when I was here last week and the week before, and the week before, you weren't here, and it was pretty boring. And I realized there's people worse off than me. I come in once a month. My Magoo was coming in every week for red cells. And not only that, his bone marrow failed him on red cells, but it also failed him on platelet. So he was covered in bruises. Then there was a really brave friend I met at in the treatment room. This friend was brave enough to do something called a bone marrow transplant. For those of us who were born blood-bound, this is kind of a new thing. Apparently, there's a potential to cure some people, and some of the little kids especially might get a bone marrow transplant to get cured. I couldn't imagine such a thing, but you can't have a bone marrow transplant if your heart is crap and your liver is crap and you've got diabetes and things like that. But this guy, he was brave enough to give it a try. Then there's Carlos, my brother. Sometimes I think about the life Carlos had, and I thought about the fact that he had to go four days a week away from school to come to Winnipeg with me. And I know he tried to be nice to me. I also sort of thought that him kicking the seat was one way of trying to punish us all for what he had to do. He was healthy. He could do everything. But Carlos knew that he was a carrier for the same disorder that I had. And I often wondered how Carlos has got that burden of trying to think about who he's going to marry and if he's ever going to have kids because he's carrying this disorder. I don't have that problem because when I was super, super iron overloaded, my pituitary gland was damaged beyond repair. My adrenal glands were damaged and I had no, sort of embarrassed to tell you this, no secondary sexual characteristic. I didn't look like a grown-up woman. I never got breasts or anything else that comes along with being a woman. I thought maybe I had one period once when I was about 19, but I'll never be able to have children. I finished grade 10 when I was 20. Had, I did it by distance education. Had to mail my schoolwork back because the, we, we couldn't afford a computer. And to go any further than grade 10 just seemed impossible. It might have been easier for the people who lived in Winnipeg. They still would have had to miss a few days a month of school. They still would have had week three of dragging around and not being able to do things with their friends. They still would have had ka-ching, 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 ka-ching all night long with their subcutaneous chelation infusion pumps. Might have been easier, but I, I never finished school. Guilt plays a huge part in my life. My parents, I know, they feel guilty because they didn't know enough to understand and they had me what could happen. I think my brother feels guilty because he kicked the back of the seat all the way to Winnipeg and back for 10 years. And he's a kid who hasn't got any problems and his baby sister does. I think he felt guilty. I feel guilty because I quit doing my chelation in my late teens and my ferritin went back up to over 7,000 and I went back into heart failure and my skin turned kind of gray looking and I just looked really sick but I felt guilty. I'd had the same nurse for 14 years. I think she looked at me and thought like what are you doing to yourself Lily? Sometimes I would forget to go for my transfusion. I didn't really forget but I just wasn't in the mood this Saturday to go in for my transfusion so I missed it and lo and behold the next Wednesday my hemoglobin was 48 and all of a sudden I have to get into the treatment room at cancer care stat I like that word so I heard that I bumped somebody I bumped somebody like they made me the priority okay I need I needed blood I have to say I needed blood with a hemoglobin 48 but I felt guilty because I didn't follow my schedule and I bumped somebody. And then I felt guilt, guilty because I've wanted to die a lot in my life. I wanted to die of heart failure from not doing my chelation. 
I was kind of hoping I'd get hit by a bus and stuff. Some people tell me that most teenagers go through this. I think I went through it just a little bit more. Dating. <laughs> I don't really think I've done that. I did go out for dinner with somebody once. But man, I look like a kid. I disappear four days a month. I have scars on both sides. Can you imagine a prom dress with scars on both sides? I would never even consider going in the prom dress store. And they just don't make them in turtlenecks. One day, I read this recently. I opened up a website, 2014, and look what it says. I'm supposed to be dead 17 years ago. I'm 34. Something's changed, but I guess in other parts of the world, lots of people with my disorder and similar disorders die and most of them die of heart disease. I don't know how long my journey is. I'm what they call a pioneer. In my great-grandparents day and my grandparents day they lost babies and toddlers. In my parents day people in Italy lost 12, 13 year old junior high, junior high people. I'm 34 I have a couple of friends in their late 30s and early 40s, but they are pioneers. I don't know anybody with beta thalassemia major who's 50 or 45. I don't know what's ahead. I have diabetes because of the effect of the iron on my endocrine system. I probably still struggle with heart failure if I don't do my chelation. And I have cirrhosis of the liver. That's the damage left behind from too much of my iron burden in my liver. I said goodbye to friends. I said, said goodbye to my Magoo. At least I got to see that I probably wouldn't see him again. Because one time he was there when I was getting transfusion and getting blood. And he was covered in bruises. And they called a code 25. And I never saw my Magoo again. The brave one didn't survive his bone marrow transplant. Some of the long distance people that I know with my disorder, beta thal major, have been gone several years now, and some of them were just a couple of years older than me. I really don't know what's in store for the rest of my life, but I'm well chelated now. I'm following my prescriptions. I'm getting my red cells transfused, and I'm walking ahead down the road. What's the what? I'm alive because of blood and blood donors and people like you. But I have an unending schedule of transfusions and iron chelation and doctor's appointments and driving. I never got a job, but they're making new discoveries all the time that might save my life and people like me. I didn't get HIV or Hep C. Every one of my friends who's in their late 30s and 40s and is transfusion dependent, has one or the other or both. There's been good things and bad things. Sometimes I felt like I wanted to die, and sometimes I felt very, very guilty. But that's my story, and I'm really hoping that it helps you to understand what's going on when you hear my story. What did you glean that you might not have known before? Okay. Fatigue and other symptoms are really profound, okay? These people do suffer in that weak pre-transfusion, and it's really hard to carry on with life. And it, I would like to challenge you as healthcare providers for us to figure out a way so that people aren't getting this up, down, up, down thing. I've done a very thorough liter literature search, and there really aren't checklists or algorithms out there to help us assess according to symptoms when a transfusion should be given. I know we all depend on the hemoglobin level and we say plus minus symptoms, but there isn't really a good list, good science, good evidence about exactly what those symptoms are. So that would be my challenge, is that you think of ways to kind of incorporate that a little bit more. Teen angst and then some. These people go through a lot. They don't get their education, they don't get their friendships, they don't get a normal body image, and the chelation is very burdensome, burdensome, unending. There is an oral chelator now, which some people can get approved for, 
makes them feel kind of sick. It can cause problems with rise in creatinine. It's not the complete solution, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. And it's a chain reaction. It doesn't just affect the person who's transfusion dependent. It affects their families, their friends. It affects the health care system. There's a lot of work done on living with uncertainty out there, and it's done a lot in a lot of chronic diseases, including cancer. I haven't seen it specifically done for this population, but we do know that some of the problems with uncertainty could probably be extrapolated to the transfusion dependent person. But one of the things is they develop uh, maladaptive coping mechanisms. And I'm pretty sure you heard that in Lily's story about, you know, how, how she probably would have wanted to, to die. Um, there's this whole sense of loss of control. You really can't plan. You get your transfusion when the treatment room space is available now. Maybe 10, 15 years ago, we tried to work around everybody's life. But they're, they are in and out of those chairs so fast now that they have to go by availability. And I want to share with you about just a couple of words about the burden for healthcare providers. This is a population that I worked extensively with for 13 and a half years. And being transfusion dependent is a bad prognosticator. In MDS, if you start out transfusion dependent, your lifespan is a lot less. For these, um, these patients who are in their young adult years, didn't have any people with congenital anemias that were transfusion dependent who were above the age of about 42. But those that I had, I had for almost 14 years. So this is another bit of a burden. It is, I know that the nurses caring for these people, the doctors caring for these people are, are all going to have to say goodbye at some point. And that takes an emotional toll. It's, it's a burden that we probably, secondary burden, granted, but it's there. It's hard to be that tied to someone for, for over a decade and then have them die. So Lily's story isn't over. Mine is.